Good evening and welcome to the JCC of Metro Detroit's 22nd annual Lenore Marwell Detroit Jewish Film Festival. We're so glad you could join us this evening. My name is Jamie Loeb and I'm the Senior Director of Cultural Arts at the JCC of Metro Detroit. Tonight's film discussion and all of our film discussions for this festival are presented in partnership with the Detroit Institute of Arts Detroit Film Theater. I want to thank them for their support and their help in making all of these live events a reality. One of the ways that the Detroit Film Theater has been involved in the festival is through their director, Elliot Wilhelm. He's one of the deans of the Detroit film scene and a part-time faculty member at Wayne State University. He'll be the moderator for tonight's event and for most of the film discussions over the course of the festival. We're very glad to have him on the team as our film expert in residence. So this is our first virtual festival, and we're so glad we're able to connect with all of you from the comfort of your own homes. The festival runs from October 4th till October 30th. All of our films, except for one special event film, are available to watch on demand throughout that entire time. And of course, we have an extensive series of free film discussions live here on YouTube throughout the month. So we hope you'll join us for all of that. You can find our full lineup of films and events. You can buy tickets to individual films or get a film festival pass right here at our website, culturalarts.jccdet.org slash filmfest. While you're here on our YouTube channel, be sure to like this video, subscribe, set the reminder bell so you never miss an exciting virtual event here from the JCC. We do want to hear your comments and your thoughts and your questions tonight. So feel free to drop a comment in the comment box below if you're on YouTube, or you can send us a text to this phone number right here, 248-973-7286. Send us a text with your comment and we will add it to the stream. Our guests have a great discussion set up for you tonight and they will take as many of your questions and comments as possible. So the film we're discussing tonight is City of Joel. It's a documentary about a Hasidic enclave in upstate New York and their complicated relationships with their small town neighbors. Our guest speaker tonight is Professor Howard Lupovich. He's an associate professor of history and director of the Cohn Haddow Center for Judaic Studies at Wayne State University. He is of course, one of our favorite friends of the festival. He often helps us out with film discussions. So we're very glad he could join us again this evening. Um, he specializes in modern Jewish history, specifically the Jews of Hungary and the Habsburg monarchy. So please join me in welcoming our host, Elliot Wilhelm, and our guest speaker, Professor Howard Lubavitch. Hello, Jamie, and hello, Howard. Hello. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Same here. Uh, Howard, I am um, um, here more to learn tonight uh, than I am to pontificate, so to speak. And I... I found this movie absolutely fascinating. Uh, I knew a little bit of what was uh, in the film in terms of the communities that we're talking about, but not a lot. And movies can bring you into a place as, as City of Joel does right from the beginning, putting you in a, in a position where you are seeing masses of people and it's just a kind of a, a thin slice of the number of people who are living in the community we're talking about. Uh, community we're talking about is uh, Curious Joel, and uh, this is a community in New York that was founded um, by uh, Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, correct, in 1977. He's a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. and the community grew to be something like 25,000 people within a, a, a square mile area, um, if I'm not mistaken or close to it. And the film is about um, conflicts of all sorts, conflicts with uh, people who moved to this area because of the lack of population um, and conflicts within the Satmar community uh, itself. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the way the community started um, and uh, its its background. Tell us a little about Rebbe uh, Teitelbaum. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the place to start is really understanding who the Satmar Hasidim are, because they are Hasidic Jews, but they're in some ways 
they're not your typical Hasidic Jews. If we were to place uh, Hasidic Jews on a spectrum of, uh, let's say, um, more more openly disposed to non-Hasidic Jews and modernity on the one side, I didn't want I don't want to say more worldly or liberal because that's not quite it. That's yeah, open on the one side and less open, more antagonistic to modernity on the other side. Well, the Satmar Hasidim are on the far end of the anti-modernity side of the Hasidic spectrum. They, they come from Hungary. Satmar actually used to be a city in, uh, it's a city in Northern Transylvania. Today it's called Satu Mare in Romania. Actually, it just means- St. Saint Mary. Saint. So they're, yeah. really, they're really the St. Mary Hasidim. But, but Satmar Hasidim, uh, it's, it's, a brand of, it's a brand of Hasidim, which really it's a blend of Hasidic Judaism with Hungarian ultra-Orthodoxy. So since their founding, uh, well, over 150 years ago, they have been the most anti, anti-modern of Hasidic Jews. So I'll just, I'll just give you a contrast. Uh, Lubavitch, which is also very, very familiar to us, Chabad, they're also, they are, they are just as observant, just as traditional in their practice, in their belief. But the difference is, is the way they understand their relationship with modernity. And the difference is this, uh, uh, you know, in sociological terms, we would call Satmar Hasidim, they have a rejectionist view of modernity. Anything that's modern in any way is trafe to them. Whereas Lubavitch, even though they are, they are also very pious, they see in modernity potential and possibility. So Satmar Hasidim will not watch television at all because television as a modern innovation is by definition unkosher and unacceptable. Lubavitch or Hasidim, they will use television, but for a very specific purpose, they will use the tools, a tool of modernity like television to disseminate and spread their own ideas. So their notion of modernity, of modern things, be it technology, be it ideas, be it politics, it's a tool for them to use to further their own, their own interests. So Lubavitch would put the Rebbe on TV. Lubavitch have learned to use the internet. Lubavitch will work with the state of Israel in their political system. Satmar will do none of those things. And one of the reasons they moved from Williamsburg, the, from, the, from Brooklyn to Kiryas Yolo in the first place is because even though they had their own enclave and their own neighborhood in Brooklyn, and they were pretty isolated, they wanted to be completely isolated from modernity. So in their mind, they were picking up and moving to the middle of nowhere. If, if you know, if, if you, uh, just to make the Satmars clear, in case you don't know, if you've ever read Chaim Potok's The Chosen and The Promise, uh, well, the, 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 the Hasidic Rebbe who won't speak to his son, who raises his son in silence, that's the Satmar Rebbe. He is based on the Satmar Rebbe. They are uh, completely inhospitable to anything, anything that modern. So they moved to Kiyasuela to be in the middle of nowhere. They didn't really imagine anyone was there. And when they first got there, they were an anomaly to the people living in that part of upstate New York, most of whom probably had only rare, rarely met Jews, and uh, they associated Jews you know, in New York City. They didn't really know what to make of them. When the Satmars first arrived, it was fairly benign, and they didn't really change the character of the city. But one of the characteristic features of the Satmar community and most other Hasidic and Haredi communities is a very high birth rate. So when your average family has eight or 10 children within a generation or two, the family gets very, very, the community got very, very big, but they don't want to spread out, partly because they didn't own the land beyond the small village that they bought. But also another characteristic feature of this community is they want to be close together, close together in terms of synagogue, close together. They don't ride in a car on Shabbat or holidays. They need to be within walking distance of each other. And as the community grew, it did not naturally expand. It became more and more concentrated. And uh, the, the area they were living, because they, they had to build up. They couldn't, uh, the houses got closer and closer together. And then they had multi-floors and then they started to build apartment buildings. So suddenly this rustic little part of upstate New York, where m most people are living to get away from the city, suddenly starts to look like a piece of the city is transplanted. And they really didn't like it. And I, and I have to admit, they have a point because they, they, they were living in that part of the world for that very, very reason. People, oftentimes people who live 
in small remote areas are trying to escape the crowdedness and the noise of the big city. Right. Let me just add one last thing about the Satmars, and, I, and I'm gonna I'll put a little disclaimer on this. Is what I'm about to tell you. It gives me a I don't know I don't know how to put it. I I, I have a little well I'm not I, I'm not a big fan of the Satmars for the following reason. Joel Teitelbaum, the eponym, the guy the guy after whom this village is this town is named. He made a rather controversial comment in the aftermath of the Holocaust at the end of the 1940s or around 1950s. He said that the Holocaust was God's divine retribution for assimilation and Zionism. It didn't go over very well. Yep. So it, when you when you know about that comment, it, it makes it more difficult to be objective. So I just want to sort of put that out. If some of my own personal, let's call it venom toward the Satmars leaks out tonight, I apologize. I'm going to try to be as objective as I can. But I'm glad you put it gently and said yeah. some of your venom. Yeah. Yeah. The spirit of full disclosure. You should be uh, more forthcoming. I will do my best. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly not what the other people in the area bargained for. Not at all. And there's talk in the film about um, the the city council, um, and at a, at a certain point in the movie, they're talking about we need more territory. We can't fit more people into these firm borders that we have now because you describe the place as looking kind of like a, a little chunk of Manhattan stuck in the middle of this this area, which it, it sort of does, but it also has a, the feel in some ways of, of the Corleone compound. If it had more right. uh, you know, tall buildings and taller houses. And there's a scene early on in the film in which uh, we're being driven around the neighborhood and they're talking about some of these buildings that have 16 or 18 units in them. Uh, and, and that area used to have uh, a single family home or have one and a half families living there. And they're talking about the, the cost of, of being able to, to do it this way. But again, it's all of the, the togetherness. So there comes into question the idea of um, uh, an area being governed in a theocratic fashion. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about some of the conflict that develops yeah. in the film with the, with the city council? It's a, it's a great question. Now, now uh, Satmar Hasidim, like other Hasidim, like other Haredi groups, they have a, a, a certain political strategy they'll use when dealing with a city or a town or even the state. They tend to be single issue people. So, so they, they, they've been, this is, and this is, this is for the last two centuries, Hasidic Jews, Satmars and others have been very good at making deals with the state. They'll basically state whoever the state was, whether it was the Tsar of Russia, whether it was the Habsburg Emperor, whether it was even a, a local, a, 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 if, the, if the area was run by the church, uh, they made the same deal with Lenin and Stalin. If you, if you uh, give us this concession, then we as a group will solidly support you. They, they vote as a hive. They all vote together. So if there are 25,000 people in this area, then if you, if you give them what they want, you get 25,000 votes. If you don't give them what they want, then someone else can, ought, can easily pick up 25,000 votes, which I think is around 50% of the population. Uh, and it, it's, it's tempting for, in this case, city council people, city council members. The other thing they've been very good at doing in Kiryas Yoel, they have an infiltration strategy. In this particular instance, they only put, they have a couple of city council, you know, uh, city council members who are allied with them, but the real clever thing they did was to get involved with the school board. Now, as you may imagine, they don't use public schools. So they got involved with the school board to be able to, uh, well, the, the phrase we would use now is defund public schools or give less money to the schools so that money could be used for things that will help them personally. For example, uh, utilities, transportation, sanitation. So they've been able to insert themselves into local politics in a way which is very effective because there's no other block of 25,000 people in that small town, and that's in that area, which, has, which is as tightly united and which moves as a single hive unit. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a Star Trek fan, we're talking Borg here. That they, they, 
they are so co so well coordinated. And when their leader says to vote one way or to not vote one way, they all follow along. So they have a, they, they've acquired a lot of influence that way, which makes it very frustrating for other members of the town to to deal with because simply in a, in a, in a political way, they're they're very they're very well entrenched. They've mastered that strategy. So, uh, talk a little bit about the the um, uh, annexation attempt that was made in the film, along the lines of what you were just talking about. Uh, how was that uh, orchestrated? Uh, because it seems that there was a a, a larger uh, plot that was originally, and I don't mean you know machinations. I'm talking about plot of land right. that was originally uh, um, being eyed. But there was something smaller that they ended up settling for. Did I did I grab that correctly? As I was, you did. You did. They they yeah. want they wanted to expand and they they want land adjacent to the to, to the area they have now. Right. And that they've made no bones about the fact what they're going to do with it. They're going to turn it into the same thing they've got. So they're going to take more country area and turn it into city area. Uh, and um, they're they're basically using the the big the the big thing against them are the zoning laws because certain areas are zoned for certain purposes. So the the, the land they want to acquire is zoned for farmland or single unit single unit houses or you can only have so many people per square mile or per per area. So they need to change the law or change the zoning of the city. So their connections to the city council allows them to do this. And and even though. They even if they themselves are not on the city council, the, the the city council members whom they support really, in a lot of ways, they have no choice here, because if they don't honor their honor their commitment to give the Satmars what they want, come next election they're going to be voted off, and someone else who who who, who wins the Satmars is is going to is going to take that place on the city council. So. Yes, they wanted a larger piece. In the end, they, they had to settle for less with the notion, though, and I think this is this is implicit in the film that uh, they're not in this, that this is not a short game for them. They're in this for the long game. They're not going anywhere. If they don't get what they want in this in this round of this of this conflict. They'll get what they want in the next one because they have the power and the influence and the means to change the to change the kind the, uh, change the city council. They can put friendly, they can get friendly city council members on the council. And they've done it in a clever way because they're not themselves sitting on the council. They're getting other people to make the decision for them. So they got a little bit of land. They're okay with that. They know eventually if they want to, they can pressure their neighbors. Now the neighbors, the neighbors are pushing back and they're, uh, they're pushing back the only way they can. They have to describe the, the downside of allowing the Satmars to have more territory. And so I think one of the larger questions that coming out of this film, and really the, the central question of the film, is the opposition that the Satmars are fa is facing, is it anti-Semitic? Right. Is it anti-Semitism? And the Satmars, of course, immediate, any, any murmur of opposition, they immediately call it anti-Semitic. And is that because of, of a genuine belief um, based on historical experience, or is it a go-to solution to to knock out criticism right off the bat? Yeah, let me let me take a breath and a pause to regain some of my objectivity at that question because <laughs> my knee jerk I have a knee jerk answer there, but let me you know let me let me try to give you a balanced answer there. Look, look the, yes, they have had the experience of anti-Semitism. Most of them. Uh, most Satmar Hasidim were killed in the Holocaust. There's no question about that. And uh, the you know the surviving remnant, you know the, their term for it was the Sha'arita Pleita. The surviving surviving remnant either came to the New York area, some of them went to Israel, a few of them went to Montreal. So yes, they do have the sense that they are two or three generations removed from this catastrophe. They and they use the expression that every child born is a blow against Hitler. Right, and yes. And the large families are to to repopulate. That, yes, that, that is very, very true. Um, now, here's the problem, here's the problem. Here's the other side of that. First of all, yes, they wanna repopulate the Jewish people, but they really don't add anything, they don't contribute anything to anyone other than themselves. In other words, 
there are no Jews in the world who are benefiting from there being more Satmar Hasidim other than Satmar Hasidim. I mean, that's another difference. Chabad will Chabad Hasidim will go out and, and make sure that every Jew in America has Friday night dinner or a place to go to synagogue or shake the lulav or be in a sukkah or whatever. That, you know, and that, you know, th those those are the Hasidim who are asking you, did you put on tefillin today? Right. Satmars are not them. They care nothing for anyone outside their own enclave. Never mind, they only care. They, 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 they wouldn't talk to Jews who aren't religious. They don't talk to Jews who are not Satmar Hasidim. Their arch enemies are Lubavitchers. That those those are the Jews they consider to be the biggest heretics of all. Just to jump in quickly, and I don't mean to interrupt, but when they were we're all living in Brooklyn, right? Um, were there like gang fights? Were there uh, was there like street violence between the? Well, there was you know, there, I mean, there was some, but the Satmars weren't being singled out, right? Yeah. So when you live in Brooklyn, especially if you live, live in Brooklyn in the fifties and the sixties. There was, you know, it, it was a neighborhood. There were different peoples living close together. But it wasn't just the, the Sadmars versus the Lubavitchers. Or... No, no, no. 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 Like, yes, they, look, there were gangs. Yeah. They, they dealt with that. But I don't think, I, I wouldn't call any of that, it, it wasn't simply Jews who were being targeted. You yeah. see, the other, pro it's, it's, the other problem with the accusation of anti-Semitism is you have, to, you have to try to understand the motivation of the people who are opposing them. And what I would suggest is, the people do not have a problem with, with the fact that there are 25,000 Satmar Hasidim in one square mile. They have a problem with the fact that there are 25,000 people in one square mile. 25,000 of anybody would have caused a problem here. If you had 25,000 uh, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, it would have elicited the same response. 25,000 who are just like the people living around. It's, it's the crowdedness. So for the Satmars to call this anti-Semitism is problematic. I would say the burden of proof is on them. Now in the film, there, I, there's one moment where there is a kind of, let's call it an anti-Semitic slur, but this is the exception. Right. This is not about the, the presence of Jews. This is about the presence of too many people. This is an anti-urban thing, not an anti-Semitic thing. And it seems clear to me, and this is part of this is one of their strategies, is they know that anyone they accuse of anti-Semitism is immediately going to back down because post-Holocaust, post-Hitler, nobody wants to be accused of being an anti-Semite. No one wants, certainly these people, they don't want to be associated with Hitler. And so they 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 turn tail at the very accusation of it. Now the Satmars, they're compounding the the use of anti-semitism as a kind of tool to to refute criticism they they in, in a very also in a very quick way they immediately throw out we are holocaust survivors they use they use that also as i don't know i mean they, in a manipulative sort of way it, it's a couple generations later thankfully they're all alive they're there but the people they're yelling at these are not nazis these are, these, these are not the people who, who cause that. All they want is to preserve a certain way of life. And, and, and the real evidence, I think, comes that when the Satmars, until their numbers got big enough, there was no problem with them being there. Their neighbors were perfectly happy. In fact, some of their neighbors, I think one of the interesting characters in the film is the, is the Christian evangelical who's wow. on the city council. He likes having other pious people around. It's the problem is not with the fact that they're Jewish or or, or Hasidic or Satmar. The, the the problem is that they're so densely packed. It's that it's the way uh, it, it's that mode of life, which isn't specifically Jewish. It's simply too dense. And that's having um, a real effect now in terms of the pandemic, correct? Yes. Well, the, the pandemic, it's interesting. The timing of the film, it came out just before the pandemic right. i mean it was made just before the pandemic so the pandemic and the way that communities like the satmars have responded or ignored the pandemic it, it, it's not creating a problem it's really underlining or exacerbating an existing problem so the, the satmars as a community they do their best to live according to a separate set of laws so they are law-abiding citizens in fact they, they, they are playing by the rules of the rule of law. They're using the system very, very well, but they live within the system. But at the same time, and this is one of the ironic or paradoxical things 
about the Satmars. These are law-abiding American citizens who at the same time are doing their best to live as much of their life as, lives as possible outside the realm of American society and law and culture and politics. They want to, they want to, they want to imagine like they're still living in an isolated or insular Jewish community. I mean, one of the- What about, go ahead. Good. What about oh, science? Uh, I know not in terms of modernity, there's talk about movies, you know, nobody's gonna do that. That's a, you know, that's a common Hasidic um, thing. But in terms of say, wearing masks or distancing, granted, when you have that many people packed together, distancing is, is pretty much a fantasy. Yes. But is distancing something that's accepted in, in any way? It's interesting because their relationship with science, I would say it's not a direct relationship, but it's a mediated relationship in the sense that if one of their leaders, if one of their rabbis said, we are all going to wear masks, then they will all wear masks. So it really comes down to there are a few, a handful of leaders. If they accept the science, they all accept the science. And if they say, this is not something we need to do, then no one is going to do it because you are defying your own rabbinic leader, which is a big, big no-no. But there's more than that. Uh, they're, they're making a balance. I mean, look, we've all had to balance between how safe we want to be versus how much of our lives we want to reclaim and be able to live. And there's a whole spectrum, there's a whole range of responses in that way. For the Satmar's perspective, they're, they believe that the ultimate important act are, are, is to observe Jewish commandments. So going to the synagogue, uh, going to the yeshiva to study, going to public celebrations, Doing these things, even if there's a risk, is far more important than not doing them and, and incurring the risk of divine wrath. They have a belief in God in which God is really a more imminently and immediately part of their life and their lives. And if you do something, if you transgress, they believe there will be some sort of actual divine retribution. And they also believe that if you have faith in God, then somehow God is going to protect you from this pandemic. They put more faith in God and let's say reciting Psalms than they do in science. Is there a belief among them that the pandemic was brought for a reason? They haven't articulated that yet. That, that will come in time. You, usually that, that kind of, um, I don't know, that kind of explanation is usually an after the fact kind of thing. When right. they look back, they will say, Clearly, the pandemic was probably a punishment for something. And, you know, and living, and living in American society uh, with all its non-Orthodox Jews, that, that they have a laundry list of things. They will have a laundry list of things to blame the pandemic on. But for now, it's more strategic. It's how do they uh, get around any kind of attempt to restrict their religious lives, which they see, uh, which they see as a problem. There's one additional layer as well. Uh, they tend to be prone or vulnerable to sources of information which claim that the pandemic is a hoax. Uh, that they're going to buy into that. Remember, they're they're not reading, they're not getting information from the outside. They're not reading the New York Times. Yeah, they're definitely not reading the New York Times. But they're not even watching Fox News. They're not, and they're not they're not looking at QAnon. Thank God. Yeah. And, and but one of the but where they get the information is. You have, if someone brings, someone will write a pamphlet in, in Yiddish, which is their language, or maybe Yiddish and Hungarian, and will bring them a pamphlet in their own language. And whatever that pamphlet says, as long as it's, you know, as long as it has the approval of their rabbinic leader, that is going to be the first and last word on the truth behind the pandemic. So it's kind of like an ambulatory version of Facebook. There's, there's a, you know, a walking social network that, that here's, yeah. here's the story. Here's the, the Except on conspiracy Facebook. theory necessarily, but here's the belief. This is what we all believe. But except on Facebook, you can have multiple points of view. Right. If, fa if, it's, if it was Facebook, if only Mark Zuckerberg was allowed to post. Yeah. Only one person gets to decide truth. Everyone else gets to have an opinion on what the truth is, but the facts are really set by one individual. And to challenge them, well, it's it's dangerous. I mean, I think that's the other dimension is, and this is apart from this film, there have been people, men and women who have left this community. It's extraordinarily difficult. Even even the, 
the suggestion that you might leave leads to complete ostracized, being ostracized. You're cut off from your family. You can be cut off from your children. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I, I hate to make the parallel, but it's a lot like Scientology in that way. Yep. I was thinking about, um, the, you know, the L. Ron Hubbard stuff as I was watching it in some ways. And you don't want to draw the direct comparison on well, a, they're, on they're a religious basis, but in behavioral, but uh, behavioral, way, yes, it because, felt like uh, the rigidity that is alarming. In a the, way. Uniform, the imposed uniformity. I mean, the big difference between Hasidic group, Hasidic Jews like the Satmars and Scientology is authenticity. I mean, Hasidic Judaism is based on uh, not only 200 year old ideas, but even the original ideas are rooted deep in Jewish tradition, in right. Jewish mysticism. There is a, there is a reason, there is a, a rationale for it. It's response to modernity though, and here the Satmars are unusual among Hasidic Jews, it's maybe a little bit when they went off the rails and the pandemic has really strained their ability to separate themselves. Because the problem here is, and one of the things that, one of the, one of the, the, the questions, the issues that the pandemic has raised is that what you do or don't do doesn't only affect you and your family and your right. community, but it affects those around you. And so the people living in close proximity to the Satmars, if there are 25,000 people ignoring Social distancing. That's community spread. That's community in a spread. in a big way. Yeah. So the, you know, you were, you were mentioning um, uh, the uh, ostracizing of of people who want to want to go, want to get out. There's a young woman in the film who we see toward the end of the documentary who has had that experience, um, which has been dramatized in in other films. And there's another woman in the film who is um, very much of the party line and talks about how women were born to be modest and that this is the way we live and this is it. And she's, you know, quite adamant about it. But it's it's a it seems to be a story about men. And women are are seen in the film, but in a sense what's what's their role other than cooking caring for the children well i mean is, is that i mean is there is there a larger unrest than than we are able to glean from watching a documentary like this that's a great question and the answer is maybe um in the sense that first of all the community isn't a it's very it's, it's entirely patriarchal where right. all, all decisions are made by men, right. and women are in a position of subservience. Now, if you ask them, they wouldn't call it patriarchal. They would say there is a division of labor right. between the public and the private sphere, between the community, between community events, which are in the hands of men. Men are in charge of the synagogue, men are in charge of the stores, men are in charge of public decisions, leadership, but the homes are run uh, exclusively by women, and that's accurate. Women are in charge right. of the home, and men defer to their wives about decisions that have to do with the home. Um, but a community-wide decision, even community decisions about what's acceptable in the home are going to be made by men, no question. The problem with dissent is twofold. First of all, to really dissent, uh, to have any, to, to really disagree in a serious way, you have to have the requisite knowledge to be able to do it. You have to know um, the alternate reality or the, the world outside your own world and women even more so than men have virtually no exposure. I mean, they, they really don't know that there's anything different. So the way they live their lives, one of the reasons they say I was born to do this is they don't know anything else. But secondly, even if they somehow acquired the knowledge, they're not in a position of authority or influence to, 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 uh, to, to dissent. Right. To disagree, it's not. It's not for them. Their, theirs is to 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 run the home, and but the rules of running the home and the customs of running the home are not for them to decide. They have inherited a body of not of, of a set of rules, and they, they will uh, follow these rules to the best of their ability. And and the other, you know, sort of the corollary to that is children who do not grow up properly, uh, or when children do not grow up properly, it's the mother that's going to be blamed. A, a young boy doesn't want to go to synagogue. Doesn't want to study. The, doesn't want to sit and study. It's the mother's fault, not the father. 
even though she herself isn't allowed to do these things, she is expected to instill in her children, sons and daughters, love, devotion, piety, and supreme obedience. Heads I win, tails you lose. We're starting to get some, some questions. Um, uh, somebody wants to know, um, Michael Horowitz, how does Satmars earn a living? Do they work? Do they conduct commerce outside the community? Uh, they have, um, they work. The, the, the men work, sometimes the women work. What they've managed to do is to develop an economy which allows them to interact with the outside world in a strictly economic way. This isn't something new to the Satmar community. This was often true of Jewish communities in Eastern Europe as well, where they would do business, but do business in a way which would minimize contact with the outside world. Typically, most of them today are in some form of commerce, uh, but they can work. You know, technology has helped them in this way. They can work remotely. You don't, you know, if you if you sell something online, you don't really have to interact with people. But they're and they're also they're also involved in the tech world. So the the leadership of this community has basically vetted vetted those occupations which allow the community to make money without while, while minimizing contact with the outside world. So if you work, for example, you work in a business where everyone in the business is a satmar chassid, everyone in the store, you're only working with other satmars, then you're able to, you can conduct a successful and profitable business without really interacting with anyone who's not a satmar. Or if you do, it's online, it's, it's maybe on the phone, but contact is minimalized. So yes, they do work. This is not a this is not a community of paupers. Right. This is a this is a community that is uh, is self supporting. Um, let me ask you another question about uh, local governments. We see in the film uh, the relationship, how it works, how it doesn't work, what the what the balance is. What is the attitude of the the government of the state of New York of uh, Cuomo, for example? What is the, the political balance sheet in a way? Um, what's the attitude? And is it live and let live? Is it um, trying to, to, to pressure the community to act in a, in a different way? What's, what's it look like in, in Albany? It's a great question. It's a great question. And I mean, uh, first, this is a this is a very difficult community, a complex 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 community to deal with. So on the one hand, for the most part, they are so insular that, with respect to anyone around them, they tend to they are law abiding citizens. You rarely hear about a satmar chassid robbing a bank or dealing drugs outside the community or assaulting. They I mean they live amongst themselves. Now within their own community, it's not the same. Within their own community. Yes, there there is crime. It's just hard to know how much there is because it's all, it's usually covered up. It's very internal. It's dealt with internally. You know, there was a study done about ten or fifteen years ago where it turns out in that community there was a lot more child abuse and wife abuse than was than was imagined. That, that's a different story. Now, as far as the government, how the government deals with them, they are law abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. They are also an important voting block. If if you are Governor Cuomo. You cannot ignore that. If you are a, if you are a politician on any level of government, where, where you're dealing with this community, it's going to be tough for you to ignore that. Uh, by the same token, by the same token, when they are acting in a way which is contrary to what needs to take place, and this is something which came out during the pandemic, yes, they have to be nudged and nudged to act a certain way. But they're very difficult to move because uh, politically. They are real. They, they sit. They've situated themselves really well. They they they're very good at finding allies, and the allies will defend them. So when Governor Cuomo, for example, wants the Satmars to behave in a certain way, or in in the city of New York, when Mayor De Blasio trying to deal with Haredi communities as as COVID hotspots, he's dealing not only with a community which has a very um, skilled, you know, a, a very uh, well crafted political organization. But with politicians who have to support them, they know if, if not to support them, and I mean hundred percent is political suicide. So, so you have to deal with them gently. You ha you have to deal with them. Um, you have to deal with them with a, with, a, with a bit of subtlety. But 
it, it's uh, it, and here I'd say here's the comparison with the Corleone complex. W you know, at, at least according to The Godfather, which is the extent of my knowledge of the Corleone family, that it was pretty clear to the state that these were criminals. That's not true here. Exactly, and and that's kind of where I was going. If there are no laws, actual laws being broken, doesn't it come down to don't they have a right to live the way that they want to live? Well, that's a great question. Because yes, in yes, they're not breaking the law per se, but there is a there is a. I mean, there's an expectation of being a good neighbor. And we all have neighbors who irritate us. Well, but your neighbor. Uh, or, yeah. In, in this case, I, I think it's gone a little bit. I think initially it might have been they're irritating to their neighbors, but now when they're when they are trying to, well, by expanding means that they're essentially forcing their neighbors to sell their land who don't want to. Or going to be pressured or even coerced. There, you're getting right up to the line of the line between bad neighborly and extortion. Now, they haven't crossed that line. Yet. That's just it. That line has to be really right. they haven't defined and not and not appear to be, um, because it's still a country of laws. Yes. One and one of the reasons why uh, they haven't simply been shut down the South Mars is they really haven't broken any laws yet. Mm -hmm. I think morally or ethically, I think they've behaved not only you know. And so far as you're supposed to be helpful to your neighbors, I think they've been a little selfish, but that's not that's not against the law. That's yeah, and it's also not unique in, in American communities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And most are guilty of having a character flaw. Uh, let's call it a collective character, character flaw. But no, they have not. It, it, you can't point to a law they've broken. Now, here's the thing, uh, and this is just sort of my own supposition. One of the reasons why... Uh, we can't point to laws that they've broken is is that no one really knows what's going on in there. It is entirely yep. possible that they are breaking laws. We would never know because they are so closely closely knit and uh, to to reveal what's going on, the, the consequences are so dire that no one has said anything. But for, and, and, so, and maybe someday someone might. Maybe someday someone who leaves the community might blow the whistle on this. But for now, no. They are law-abiding citizens, um, and and that's how the state deals with them. And that's part of the frustration of their neighbors, I think, is their neighbors can't say, you've broken the law, we don't want you to do this. They are acting within the law. They are manipulating the law, but they're still within the law. Now, the one exception, I would say, is what they did with the school board is legal, but it's really, I mean, getting yourself elected on and taking over the school board so you can defund a school it's not illegal, but it's wrong. I mean, that's, you know. But looking at it from the other side and, and just, you know, at this point, taking a, a, a different point of view, um, if we are going to go back to the Holocaust, in, in, in Germany, um, it, it, there was, you know, nothing illegal about being Jewish until there was. The laws were changed at a, at a certain point. And... Isn't there a kind of a, a an innate uh, um, memory, a timeline of how laws can change? I mean, we're living in a time right now when laws can change very quickly. We've we've seen yeah. uh, it it be declared illegal for people of a certain faith to enter the country, for example, by the president of the United States. Um, is is it possible to be too complacent? about these things um, well, yes. and, and to say, well, yeah, the, the Satmar community isn't, isn't behaving the way we would really like them to behave. But then where do we go with that? Yes, yes, complacence is important. But I, I, I think with the Satmars, I don't, think, I don't think they're doing any of this because they're concerned that the laws could change and suddenly there might be some uptick of anti-Semitism. The only anti-Semitism they're going to encourage is is uh, is really going to be from their neighbors who are annoyed. I mean, yes, there are other sources that they've encouraged from time to time, but they're, they're not on a precipice where suddenly their rights are going to be violated. Their rights have not been violated at all. They've been, they've been allowed to live freely as they want, despite all the problems that it's created for their neighbors. No one has really bothered them. And I think along these lines, one of the one of the ironic parts, if the concern was some kind of uptick of anti-Semitism, of sort of a replicating Nazi Germany kind of situation. I mean, they politically they've allied with themselves with the people 
who are most supportive of that kind of anti-Semitism. I, under, I understand that too. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think that's part of the calculus here. They're, they're, they're using, they're, they're, they're shouting anti-Semitism, crying anti-Semitism, but they don't have a really genuine concern that suddenly their neighbors are going to, are going to expel them. I mean, if anything, if anyone's going to be forced out of that town, it's everyone else but them. They're, they're in a position of superiority. They're in a position of real power, which really underscores one of the differences between these communities in America and these communities in Europe, whether it's Western Europe or Eastern Europe. In Germany, or especially in Eastern Europe, where these Hasidic communities were, no matter how big they were, they for a long time, they were second-class citizens with some influence, but not no real political power. Here, they have real political influence and they have real political power. They are part of the system. They not only have full citizenship, but they have they have figured out how to work the system in their own favor. So they're playing not from a position of disadvantage, but on the contrary, they're playing this game from a position of advantage because they, they, they won't be pushed around because no politician is gonna is gonna is willing to take the risk of making the sacrifice. So I think they're they're uniquely not in danger as a community. And one of the things that the pandemic has shown is the pandemic has posed a danger to them, an existential danger, but it hasn't come from an anti-Semitic source. It's come from their own as really a result of their own behavior, or they're they're not being singled out in any way. So it's difficult as much as they want to play the show a card in their favor it's really difficult to 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 draw that parallel or to make that connection because their situation in america is so different i'll just just put it in a very basic way uh, a hasidic community in in uh in europe if they had picked up if they had acquired a whole village somewhere which was which was not jewish the flags it would have raised and the, and the backlash it would have elicited immediately here it raised no backlash for several decades until the, until they got very, very big. I'm gonna ask Jamie to, to come in with a, a couple of questions that she might be getting because we're nearing the end. But um, I also wanted to ask, it's a film festival and I wanted to know what you thought of City of Joel as a film, as a documentary. I thought it. I thought it was great. I, what I really like. What, what, what I really look for in documentaries is a, is a balanced is a balanced presentation. And I thought the filmmaker was very fair. I mean, he clearly he's much more balanced than I am on this subject. If I was making the film, it would have looked very very different. The filmmaker did a great job presenting not only the he presented the Satmar's point of view, and he allowed the Satmar's again representatives of that community again and again to basically plead their case. We're just trying to live our way. But he also gave voice to the opposition. He allowed those people who are being accused of being anti-Semitic to explain that they're not being anti-Semitic. They're simply trying to get a, a keep things fair. They're really, they're, they're really trying to maintain a balance, which has been thrown off by this massive, this, this large, dense population in the middle of this area. These are really just sort of upstate people who want to live in a small town in a rustic area who are simply trying to preserve that. I, I think the filmmaker did a very good job, made it very clear that, that these are not people, the, the issue here is not there are Jews in upstate New York. The issue is there are 25,000 Jews in one square mile of upstate New York, 25,000 people. And, and I, I came away from the film wondering how incidental it was that this community is Satmar. Like I said, it could have been any community of 25,000 people, and we would have this, we would be having the same discussion. Now, the one twist is the insular, insularity of the Satmar community, because someone from outside, if let's say if one of their neighbors wanted to move into that densely populated area to experience a more urban feel, they wouldn't be allowed. It's, it, it is an isolated community. But I think that's secondary to the fact that the Satmars want to live the way they want to live, but they're not really taking in, into account the cost to other people. And I think the filmmaker did a great job of showing those points of view. I think he 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 uh, he exposed things about the Satmars without turning into a critique of the Satmars. 
It'll be interesting to hear from people who have seen the movie, um, if they agree with that, if they don't agree with that, uh, if they're motivated to see it. But if you've got a question, um, type it in. And uh, Jamie, are you getting getting questions yeah. from the community? Let's, we, let's uh, we bring them a, in. We've touched on a lot of the questions, obviously, so thank you for that. Um, a couple that there's a couple sort of touching on the same issue that obviously uh, Howard you have studied this at more community you have your own ideas about them but what is the I guess the other point of view not so partially we've talked about the the different point of views in the film but how would the Satmars in that part of upstate New York describe themselves in terms of their dealings with the school board, their dealings with the state, all of all of those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I, 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 I'll try to get into the mind of the Satmars. Um, what they believe is, is, is that everything they do is really in the name of sanctifying God. They believe they are fulfilling a mission in the world. And, and because of that, because of the, the lofty nature of that mission, they believe that whatever it takes to accomplish that mission, as long as you're not literally causing harm to people, it's worth it. So as long as you're not killing anyone or burning houses down, or it, it, it's fine. But the, the, in their minds, their mission is sacred. And creating that Satmar community and preserving it and allowing the Satmars to live, uh, their members to live a pious life the um, it's it's it, you do whatever it takes to do that uh, and the one other thing is yes they they have passed for several generations the idea that they have a response of, that they are personally rebuilding after the holocaust they have they have taken that mantle of re, uh, of replacing those who were killed in the holocaust so the combination of those two things uh, they would say is the justification for everything that they're doing so taking over the school board they would say, look, the school board is important for everyone else, but we need what we need. We are more pious than everyone else. We are the ones who are serving the glory of God here. And remember, they believe that their service of God and their observance of commandments it ultimately isn't only going to help them, but it's going to bring the messianic age, which is going to make the entire world perfect and better for everyone, Satmar and everyone else. So they, they believe that what they're doing is a service to all of humanity, especially for Jews and especially for Satmar Hasidim. That's how I think they would defend themselves. Sure. And obviously other Jewish communities think of themselves differently, but you can understand a community that was so specifically devastated by the Holocaust, viewing that responsibility a little differently. Um, another- well, well, except, except the problem is there were other communities that were equally devastated that are not doing this. Uh, Chabad is a great example. Most Chabad, Chabad Hasidim were killed in the Holocaust, but they've taken a much more, I don't know, cooperative and interactive view of the outside world. They don't do this. So I just, I, I think as a caveat, it's important to note that. Sure. So we have another question about why do you think they allowed themselves to be filmed, given how insular they are, given how against technology they are, against you know, movies? <laughs> Why do you think they allowed and participated in this documentary? I, I would say two things. Um, first of all, well, it might be three. So two or three things. Let's see how this shapes out. First of all, they're, they're very savvy. So they've come to understand the power of media, and the power of film, that if you put up, if, if you are portrayed in a positive way, that's all. That's all. That's the only thing people are going to know about Satmar Hasidim. But it, it reminded me of, you know, Oprah Winfrey did this series of interviews with various people, and she in, she spent a she did a segment inside the home of Hasidic Jews in in Brooklyn. I don't know if they were Satmar or not, but they were willing to film because the exposure would be positive. So I think there's a, this understanding of the power of media, and they assumed that was going to take place is they were going to be filmed being pious Jews. This lovely, uh, you know, it was going to resonate with the nostalgia that 21st century American Jews have with the shtetl. It was going to look like Fiddler on the Roof. I don't think they were expecting this film to be about uh, this lawsuit. 
And I don't think they were expecting this film to be as balanced as it was. They were assuming that we're gonna let the filmmaker in, they're gonna show us singing and dancing, and everyone's gonna think we're wonderful people, and, 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 and help them that way. The last thing is, in some sense, the secret is out. A book was written about Kyrgyz Yoel about five or 10 years ago. This is by, a, by a, a, very, a very good historian named David Myers, and it kind of laid bare. It kind of let the secrets out of the bag. So in some ways, this film might have been seen as spin control, damage control to, uh, to the, you know, not only this book, but as members leave the community and report back, that this is not a perfect place. They needed some. They needed some spin. Is the community going to see the film? That Do they is, know? Will they? Quite, I Do have, they watch movies? I I, I think I think General. we're going to have. But personally, I think the leaders of the community are going to view the film, and everyone else is going to see a let's call it selections a censored version of the film. They're going to see they're going to see a sanitized version, just the nice parts. The they're, William Barr version. The, yes. They're going to see a much truncated version and not just the singing and dancing. They're going to see the part where uh, they call the, they, they call their critics anti-Semites. They defend themselves in terms of the Holocaust and the piety and, and this happy life, this happy idyllic life that's going on in Kiryas Yoel. So, now that's supposition on your part, correct? Completely. I have no... Okay. All right. I just want to set the record straight. But I, but I, would, be, I would be very surprised if... Everyone in Kiryas Yohel was allowed to simply view the film in an unvetted and uncensored way. I, I would be, uh, I think the, the fear of especially young people having a thought, uh, people who are, who are expected not to have independent thoughts, having one might be too much of a risk, but they're going to see part of it. Well, at least you are an, an unbiased testimonial here. So. Sure. What can I tell you? I think yeah. um, it, your response to it is a very powerful one, mm -hmm. and it will be interesting to hear what what uh, viewers of the of the film have to say. I think it's really great, um, Jamie, that the film is in the festival um, because it is a it's going to be a highly controversial uh, picture, uh, one of the most of the festival, I think. Yep. One of the things we love to do here at the film festival is get people talking, get people yep. talking about issues, about storytelling about things that are going on in other Jewish communities that they might not have known about. So we're thrilled to have this film and we were so thrilled to have Elliot Wilhelm and Professor Howard Luprovich here to discuss it with us tonight. And of course, all of you watching at home on the internet, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna remind you of our website where you can find all of our films, all of our events. We do have another film discussion coming up on Thursday, October 8th at noon Eastern time. And we'll be talking with the producer and creator of Dew's Points, one of the comedies we have uh, on our festival this year. So we hope you join us then. Elliot, Howard, thank you so much. Thank and you, everybody. everybody have a great evening. Thank you everybody. <laughs>